Long hours, heavy workloads, difficult customers. In a post-pandemic world, employees in frontline and deskless jobs in sectors like healthcare, retail, food services, manufacturing, in the pressure. And over time, it can lead to something nasty, burnout. Burnout is one of the biggest causes of frontline employees leaving their jobs. It's bad for them and it's bad for the company. So what can we do about it? This is the Culture Clinic where my co-founder Skay and I are relentlessly learning from HR experts on how to build a culture where people want to work. My name is Joe. I'm the co-founder here at Gusto. And today we're joined by Shelly DaCosta, an HR expert in rewards and recognition. Shelly, hoping you can point us in the right direction with this week's topic, burnout. So burnout tends to be somewhat of an ill-defined and misunderstood term. Just wondering, you know, what does burnout mean to you? When I think of burnout, it's it's basically stressed and exhausted. It, it's such that someone's no longer able to kind of focus or or cope with work and life. You know, a textbook definition is it's a state of emotional, physical, and mental exhaustion. Um, and it's caused by excessive and prolonged stress. It's quite different from temporary drops in performance or creativity or energy, you know, just kind of being down. It, it's usually a lot more significant, at least to me it is. Yeah. And anecdotally, how, how prevalent do you think burnout is in the workplace? I think we are seeing more and more of it than we ever have before. I would say it's very prevalent, just uh, not just since COVID, but you know, even pre-COVID, different generations, different responses to stress. Uh, and then now post-pandemic, I see it even more so as people try to you know, acclimatize to working from home still or hybrid working or acclimatize back to the workplace. It's just, it's a, it's really merged home and life. And therefore there's, you know, burnout happening in both areas. I'd say quite prevalent. And thinking back through your life and experience, have you, have you ever experienced burnout in your career? And if so, how, how did you get through it? Yeah, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, you think you're having burnout. There's times where I thought I had burnout. Uh, all this, you know, and and then later on when I had what I would call real burnout, I realized what I previously had was probably like low patches, you know. Luckily, I've been able often to really watch for the symptoms, whether that being in HR and watching other employees or seeing what's going on, et cetera, but kind of know what the symptoms are and the signs to prevent it. So stress management's key. Um, finding some kind of balance is key. So, so through my life learning, you know, okay, here's the balance where, um, my career is, you know, really taking off and there's so much going on, but what's it doing to my home life and raising my children and trying to all of that's involved with that. And so how do I find some balance? Do I need to take some time? Do I need to go to part time? How, how do I work this out on different projects I'm on, et cetera? Most important for me has always been a huge support system, whether it's family, friends, and really good relationships with coworkers. For me, the worst times were when there was huge stress in the workplace and huge stress in the home life. In my mind, usually one supports and soothes the other in times of stress. When both are burning is when I would get burned out. And I think that's common for a lot of people. Um, Simon Sinek says uh, uh, he's got a really neat little one out, not so, um, a, a talk, not so much specific to burnout, but he's talking about relationships and having that one person in our life that supports us, looks out for us and says, hey, I got you or I'm worried about you, et cetera. And he believes burnout happens when the rest of us are trying to do everything we see other people doing, but we don't realize those other people have that person in their life or they have those connections and they're not doing it alone and we're trying to do it alone. And that's, that's, I thought that was really telling because to me it is about that support system and that balance. How about you, Joe? Like, yeah, you've, uh, I mean... Yeah, when's when's your uh, uh, burnout time in the pattern? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that there was probably a time about five years ago where it, it was probably real burnout. Mm -hmm. Such a gray zone, right? I don't know, black and white burnout, not burnout, but there was it, 
to your point, so much happening on both, uh, you know, in my work life and in my personal life. As a founder, the work the work demands were were very high to extreme. Um, my partner and I had our first child, and we were also building a house from the ground up. And I think that the confluence of all of these things and the stresses just became too much. And it's really when I learned to prioritize self care as a stress management strategy, and you know, interesting that you mentioned having that one person. I mean, I'm lucky in that my, my partner is, is a physician and she, um, you know, she, she knows a tremendous amount about self-care, the things that we need to be doing to, you know, take care of ourselves and de-stress. So I had that and continue to have that person in my life, but I also made it a priority for myself. And so whether she was there or not, it was something that I realized I just had to, to figure out. Otherwise, it was like, I don't know, I was going to explode uh, human. And so, you know, daily workouts, meditation, cold plunge, journaling, like the the regiment that I needed to move into, the routine was and continues to be very, I mean, it's, I don't think it's extreme, but it's, there's a lot of things I have to do to sort of like manage. Um, and so... There's also, there was also the realization that sometimes you just have to do less and that's okay, right? It's not do nothing, but like doing less is okay. Uh, and maybe it is doing nothing for a little bit, like a few days here, a few days there, and all those little things can add up. Um, but I really did take it upon myself and in working with my partner to, you know, to manage stress. And so, you know, with that, you know, what, what role do you think employers can take in educating their people on the importance of self-care? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's like every kind of educational piece for our employees is is what can we provide? You know, we we talk about um, providing retirement planning back in the past years ago. That you know, and then it became financial wellness. What are we doing for our employees to understand? You know, the life cycle and where they're going to go, and are they investing and are they saving, et cetera, et cetera. And now. There is so much in our, our workplace required to support our employees around mental health. So, you know, that's it right there is, is what opportunities do we have for them to self-reflect or programs like EAP programs and discussions and, and things for or work out for a, a physical and mental health aspect for themselves and their families and to make that connection between those things and actual burnout. So they're able to look for those signs or, or sign up for classes on wellness and sign up for yoga classes and meditation and all of those kinds of things that promote self-care and the employer looking at employees as a whole self. You don't just come as an employee ready to do that job. You come with kids and you come with a partner and you come with past experiences in the workplace, et cetera. Uh -huh. Okay, so what do you think of... of you know, what should a people leader or manager do if an employee comes to them and says, hey, I'm feeling burnt out? Yeah. First, first is that professional support through employee and family assistance programs. And if the workplace doesn't have those programs, um, then the government agencies, et cetera, right? There's, there's lots out there for employers to tap into to provide to their employees so they get that help. Um, offer additional learning, listening time. Uh, so that, you know, more one-on-ones. It Listen is huge. Sometimes an employee just needs somebody else, if they haven't got that otherwise, to just listen to what's going on in their lives, to listen to how everything's piling on. They, they may not even be seeking solutions. And I always, you know, caution leaders and employers that you can't solve all of the problems. You can maybe point people in direction, but you can't take on the mental health of your employees. Uh, but then also just look at things like, is there vacation owing? Can, can projects be redistributed for that employee? Um, you, you can only help within your control, which is the workplace. But if it's something that's going on at home, that's also stressing and burning them out, then, you know, you've got to guide them to professionals. Um, are they feeling heard and recognized? Like, you, you know, can you up the one-on-ones and, and listening to them? Or when last were they recognized for doing a great job? 
I spoke with some frontline employees around this topic and a common thread that I heard was employees in the frontline really appreciating it when the leader put the business aside, whether it was just for a moment or a meeting and look at them as a human being, as a person first, not just that commodity to get the work done. And, and find out how you can do things differently so the individual can keep working there. Because a lot of times an employee will come to you and say, you know, there's so much stress, I quit. I got to quit. I got to get out. I got to, you know, et cetera. What can you do? And treat what they're telling you as critical. Um, you know, immediate and actionable feedback is what's coming to you. Um, think about what part they or the leader of the company might be playing in the burnout of this prolonged stress for this. Employee. It's prolonged stress and prolonged exhaustion. Is it something you're doing as a leader that's actually making this worse? Yeah, interesting that uh, you got that feedback uh, from folks on the front line. And uh, I think that there is a strong argument for caring for people personally as a business strategy because, and that may sound silly in a way, but you know, there have been huge studies around, you know, the best managers, the best leaders and, you know, Oftentimes the thing that ranks right at the top is like what made them a great leader or manager is they cared about me personally. And, you know, knowing that people often leave companies because they're leaving managers, if your managers can be uh, attuned to caring about people personally, you know, I think there's also a tremendous benefit for the company. So, um, yeah. So, you know, what do you think if anything is different about the burnout experience for frontline employees compared to those in office positions? Oh, so burnout is tough um, in all situations, hybrid workplaces, everything, you know, in hybrid workplaces, leaders can miss the signs because the employees aren't there. And in a lot of frontline workers, the leader isn't always, you know, on the floor or in that room or with them, so to speak. There's not as much social contact um, through COVID and coming out of COVID, COVID the world's a, a little bit of a lonely place, right? And more people work in shifts. Um, they don't always develop a rapport with colleagues, you know, if they're always in. And the frontline workers, they got the worst of COVID from the perspective of impact of the pandemic and, and the worst of some technology changes in the workplace. So, you know, they're often the lowest in the work hierarchy. So they have the least influence. The ones I often think of is, um, where we put in automated cash in retail stores, okay? So, you know, it's it was a business strategy, something needed to be done for the business, whether to save money, cut costs, reduce, reduce staffing, et cetera. But those frontline workers were still stuck there having to sell it, even though it was actually taking away maybe possibly some of their shifts. And they're the ones taking the backlash from the customer. You know, that that customer comes in and says, I can't use the machine. I, you know, it, I'm supposed to get a discount today and uh, you have to code that in for me. So I still need that input with you. Why did you put this machine in in the first place? This isn't easy for me. I want back my cashiers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and they're taking that backlash and they have to smile and they have to train. And what it really meant for them was a reduction in their hours, a reduction of, you know, some of their colleagues. I just think what a great example of something being done to them and you wonder how much influence they really had over it and how that can just weigh down on the stress and burn you out. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not a surprise that uh, frontline industry sees, you know, higher turnover than. Exactly. Industries. Yeah. So burnout has been a huge problem in frontline industries like healthcare and retail, especially over the last few years. And so what do you think leadership can do at the company level to help? I, I really go back to listen. Listen to those frontline employees. They often know what's wrong, not just for themselves, but for, you know, what's happening at the front lines and what needs to be done. They're hearing it all daily. It's, you know, it's also one of the best ways for you to actually hear from consumers because they're often closest to the consumers and the clients and the customers. So help to provide frontline employees with some choice and control. That's a really big one. If they're part-time, are there ways to provide support that that 
pro- they provide to full time employees. Like there's often that discrepancy between the frontline employees being all part time, part time, part time, and treated so differently as opposed to you know full time employees. So I've seen organizations where they're like emphatic about treating part time workers like full time workers, knowing your schedule in advance. Just because you're part time doesn't mean you're not part you're you're not full time committed to that organization. And that, you know, your heart and soul is what you want, so to speak, them to be bringing in. So give them the the schedules two weeks in advance because they have a life too. Um, Treat their roles more like a career than maybe just a stop on the way, which also sometimes tends to happen. Um, Those same employees that I spoke with said they'd like leaders to to meet them where they are and find out what they're looking for in their job. For, you know, do they want to develop in this role, move to full time, have a career with the organization? Or in fact, is it a stopgap for them? And that's okay too, but what can make it a a good stopgap so that they pick up hours and stick around and still want to train and be part of everything? Treating every employee with the same level of respect, regardless of the circumstances, I think is huge. Frontline are ambassadors to your company. They, They represent your company to consumers, to patients, to customers, et cetera. So you have to keep them safe um, have a no harassment and no violence policies and have those policies communicated and posted. That's another thing. You know, Frontline often gets that. they Not just as somebody complaining about the, the lack of cashiers or the new automated, but, but they can be upset with the system and the fact that the, the doctor they're waiting to see in the clinic is very, very late and they've been waiting for an hour and a half. And who's getting that? The Frontline worker. Yeah, there seems to be a common thread here. And even in your comments, um, making sure that we're caring about those people the same way we care about our full-time employees or people that are salaried versus hourly. Absolutely. Okay, so do you think it's possible to spot when employees might be heading for burnout? And if so, you know, what signs are we looking for? Yeah, they they say, you know, it's characterized by about three dimensions. There's that energy depletion we both talked about before, right? It's feelings of energy depletion or exhaustion. There's often an increased mental distance from one's job or feelings of negativism or cynicism related to one's job. They're kind of pulling away. Um, They don't have anything happy to say about any projects or any work or anyone, et cetera. And there's just that mental distance you can almost see and it's almost palpable in meetings sometimes, right? And whether it's like actual eye contact or, you know, physical being, et cetera. And then often there's a reduced professional efficacy. So in other words, I'm not producing as well. I'm not as professional as I used to be in the workplace, et cetera. You look for those kinds of things in your employees. Um, And they could be evident in many different ways, you know, how they're presenting themselves, how their personal hygiene is. like There can be so many things that can point you in that direction. If you've made an effort to know your employees, like you said, care about them regularly, you'll know when they're behaving differently. You'll say, well, wait a minute. Like, you know, Joe's always got a sense of humor, but that's really down. Like <laughs> those, are, yeah, those are really down jokes he's saying. He says, something's off. Something, this is not him. Everyone's got a different stress level and everyone has different coping skills. But if you know and care about your employees, you can start to see, well, they're not coping so well. We, you know, we change the schedule and they're not catching up. Something's wrong here. You just have to ensure processes and programs and all of that are in place to support employees and reduce stress. So, you know, vacation allocations, paid sick leave, like I said, the employee family assistance programs. And leading by example, whenever I talk about vacation, Joe, you're a a great example of that, the how powerful vacation can be if you see your leaders taking vacation. So to summarize a little bit, it sounds like um, we can spot burnout by seeing maybe some behavioral changes in, in, in people. If people are sort of operating in a way that they wouldn't normally, you know, again, maybe that's, that's hygiene. Maybe that's how they bring themselves to meetings. Maybe that's how they bring themselves to work. Are they lashing out at people? Uh, Have there been mood changes? Um, You know, those would all be sort of indicators that something's wrong and potentially it could be burnout. For sure, for sure. 
And, you know, we've been talking about, I, you know, identifying burnout and when we've had burnout or when we've seen burnout and in particular burnout in frontline employees. But, you know, a real takeaway for me is, is how do we prevent it as well? So, you know, there, we, we could be watching this and, and thinking, oh, I don't have that in my workplace. Well, what are we doing differently? Why we don't have it in our workplace? And, and how do I keep that up? And what is that? What is that secret sauce? Like you said, is, is it caring? Is it listening? All of those things. Because actually, it's a difficult thing to recover from with your employees and employees themselves, much easier to prevent. I mean, I love that. And even being introspective about uh, Gusto and the things that we're doing or not doing, you know, I think there's a, a ton that we're doing well. I do not think we're ever going to be a finished product, right? Always trying to get a little bit better, uh, but knowing how self-care has been so beneficial for me personally, you know, it makes me reflect and think that um, there's probably some education that we can provide to our people internally to help them understand how mind-bogglingly awesome uh, self-care can be. Uh, and, you know, I think of, for example, cold plunge. I, you know, took a cold plunge this morning, went into, you know, five degree uh, water for three minutes and came out a different human. Truly, you know, three minutes in cold water. Again, for some that may sound silly and for some they, that may not be the right thing for you. But uh, there are strategies like this that can really help people uh, through stressful times. And uh, I do think there's an education piece here that we can probably do a better job of. So if we can do a better job, maybe others can as well. But uh. Talking about that is is so huge because like you just think of when you see somebody on social media post a self-care aspect or e even in your employee, your individual organization's social media, you know, whether it's on Slack in the morning, somebody said, hey, I just came from yoga and I am so pumped or I just came from the plunge and this is what it did for me. And then that conversation around, well, what, why did you do that, Joe? What's this about? What do you mean by self-care? You know, that conversation alone can mean so much connection. I love it. Love it. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for raising all these, these uh, key points here. And uh, really great to chat with you today, Shelly. Always, uh, always a delight and always very insightful. So thank you for that. Thanks, Joe. Real treat. If you want a better experience for your employees, Check out Culture is the Ultimate Advantage, our free guide to creating a culture where your people feel appreciated, connected, and inspired. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please hit that like button and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And don't forget to recognize someone for a job well done today. Mucho gusto.